I'm Caleb Benjamin, intern at Lawfare, with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for September 23rd, 2023. This week, Huawei's high silicone chip design unit began shipping new Chinese-made chips to surveillance camera manufacturers. Huawei also recently released new smartphones that use Chinese-made advanced chips. The moves could suggest that Huawei has found ways to overcome U.S. export controls, which have barred it from obtaining U.S. technologies without approval. For today's archive episode, I picked an episode from May 25th, 2019, in which Lester Munson sat down with Jody Herman, Jamil Jaffer, and Dana Stroud to discuss U.S.-China relations, Huawei, cyber and tech security, the South China Sea, and more. I'm Michaela Fogel, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, May 25th, 2019. Our friends at the National Security Institute at George Mason University stopped by earlier this week to discuss U.S.-China relations. As a reminder, four former Senate Foreign Relations Committee staffers who collaborated and sometimes competed with each other on the committee participate in a lively conversation. The podcast is moderated by Lester Munson and included Jody Herman, Jamil Jaffer, and Dana Strahl. They discussed Huawei, cyber and tech security, the South China Sea, and Uyghur internment. It's the Lawfare Podcast, Episode 420, an NSI conversation on U.S.-China policy. Before we dive into the current situation and where we're going on China, we want to take a step back and kind of look at where we've been. This is a propitious moment to do that. We're on the cusp of the 30th anniversary of the massacre at Tiananmen Square, which followed the demonstration, a pro-democracy demonstration by the Chinese people. Uh, Since then, there have been a lot of ups and downs in the U.S.-China relationship. Today, there's ongoing trade negotiations between the Trump administration and the Xi administration with the prospect of a summit at Mar-a-Lago in the offing, although it looks a little distant at the moment. So we've we've got a 30-year path from Tianmen to possibly Mar-a-Lago in front of us to discuss. Jamil, uh, I want to go to you first. Do you think that our estimation 30 years ago that China was on the path to becoming something like a liberal democracy was the wrong approach? Well, I mean, I think all signs point to the contrary. The Chinese leadership uh, remains uh, largely communist focused. Their party structure remains strong. Uh, While they have adopted some elements of a market economy um, and have joined the world economics sort of system, they still continue to uh, have policies in their country that support uh, local industry, that are anathema to free trade, um, and make it very hard for U.S. goods to get in on a fair basis. Uh, That being said, U.S. economic growth is driven in part by cheap Chinese goods. That is built on the back of stolen intellectual property. Um, It's built on the back of low-paid labor. Uh, It's built on the back of an economy that fundamentally uh, is still sort of industrial in nature uh, and polluting in the way that industrial economies pollute. And so uh, it is a challenge for us. At the same time, China is in the long run a very much a strategic competitor to the United States, if not a strategic competitor, potentially a strategic winner as compared to us. Uh, there are arguments to be made that the U.S. relative to China is on the decline. Um, and those are things that we have to really take account of if we're going to be successful and not let that happen and uh, and ultimately sort of lead in the world and continue to lead in the world. and. Uh, maintain a situation where at least China is a peer and and not more than that. Jody, in addition to the the economic relationship between the United States and China, which has been, some might argue, mutually beneficial, we've benefited from cheap Chinese goods. China's uh, benefited from benefited enormously from trade with the United States. Its economy has grown tremendously. Millions of people, hundreds of millions, have been lifted out of poverty. There's a, there's a real success there. But let's turn to the kind of the values front and the democracy front. Over the past generation and a half, the past 30 years, going back to Tiananmen, have we missed an opportunity to promote democracy in China? I would start by saying this. China never looked like it was becoming a liberal democracy. It's it's tempting to believe that a specific idea or a specific policy like engagement might turn an authoritarian state from a, from an authoritarian state into into a democratic state, but internationally we haven't found that to be the case. Whether you're talking about a small country like Cuba or a large country uh, like China, so over the years, should we have done more? Yeah, could we have done more? Absolutely. 
I think I think it comes down to this. When China joined the WTO in 2001, we adopted this idea put out there by by the the trade representative Bob Zelik at the time that China would become a responsible stakeholder in the international system by virtue of its economic engagement. And as a result, we we took a step back on the democracy and human rights issues in the interim, waiting for liberal values to take hold. And and we can see now very clearly looking back that they didn't. Dana, I want to ask you a straight ahead question about Obama administration policy towards China, because it's kind of set the table for where we are today with the Trump administration. What's your assessment of the moves made by President Obama vis-a-vis China? He started the negotiations for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which which was meant to bring the U.S. closer to our allies near China. Uh, He had a pivot to Asia. He tried to have the United States less worried about the Middle East and more focused on challenges in Asia. What's your assessment, perhaps your friendly assessment of how that went for the Obama administration? So I would first just say, in contrast to the current administration's approach, which seems to view everything through through a zero-sum lens, the Obama administration took a more collaborative approach, which is engage where possible, where it's in the mutual interest of the United States, pursue in collaboration with the Chinese, where there was a shared interest, for example, we're not going to get into this, Jamil, but for example, working with the Chinese on the Iran nuclear agreement, as well as other partners and allies. But at other times when the Obama administration felt it was necessary to call out bad behavior or worrying signals or actions that threaten the security of the United States, they did. So, for example, there were indictments of Chinese nationals for the theft of intellectual property. We know there was a robust discussion during the Obama administration on whether or not and how often to do freedom of navigation operations in in the South China Sea. But generally, what the Obama administration was, was doing was looking at networks and alliances and how we could build an infrastructure that would not necessarily challenge the Chinese, but provide some security. Security for the United States. So the Asia, the Asia Pacific rebalance, not a pivot, was about saying the United States is also a Pacific nation. We need to be looking at our our network of security alliances, security partnerships, etc., in order to balance what was a, a resurgent China, and also on the Trans Pacific Partnership. So looking at the economic side of this and saying. Given the the strength of the Chinese economy and and given their economic growth, we needed to double down and strengthen our economic and trade relationships with other governments in in the Pacific region. Right. To pick up on Dana's point here about TPP, I, I really think you have to think of TPP not as a trade partnership amongst 12 countries, but as a strategic initiative by the Obama administration to counter China. That is, in fact, uh, what it was set up to be. It preferenced U.S goods and added real value. It was going to add something like $100 billion in U.S. exports to the U.S. economy. But it was as much about that as it was about country in China. Now, when we were all uh, Senate staffers together in Hill Rats, I think all of our bosses supported the TPP. And we talked about it exactly in that context of it's an important economic relationship, but it's also a strategic relationship. It addresses U.S. interests across the board. And yet, Jamil, when we when it came to the presidential campaign in 2016, it was the the candidates of both parties wanted to pull the U.S. out of the TPP. So why didn't that work? Well, I think part of it is that the you know there's always been a a strain of anti free tradeism in in the liberal part of the Democratic Party, uh, partly because of unions and the like. And we've seen a resurgence of that in the Republican Party uh, with Donald Trump um, and sort of the populist movement that he's sort of been part of in that. And so it's not surprising that free trade agreements generally are are not viewed – are viewed with skepticism by this administration um, and were viewed by skepticism um, you know, during the campaign. Now, that isn't true across the board. Obviously, Bill Clinton um, you know, uh, was, was the architect of NAFTA. Uh, we have seen a resurgence of free trade um, among moderates of both parties. That being said, when you get to the edge of the parties and when you get to the populist movement that Donald Trump is sort of the vanguard of, free trade is not the thing. And TPP became a poster child for that, I think, in some ways. Uh, and, and I think Jody and, and Dana are exactly right. This idea uh, that we pulled out of TPP and somehow that put us in a better place with, uh, vis-a-vis China is crazy. Uh, supporting our allies around the world, but particularly in that region of the world as against the strategic competitor is a key part of the effort. And pulling out of the TPP was a strategic mistake by this administration. All right. Before we uh, wrap up this segment, this kind of retrospective 
portion of the episode, I want to ask an exit question of all three of you. The question is this, considering both Republican and Democrat administrations across the board for the last 30 years, did the U.S. read China wrong? Did we not understand what was really going on with the People's Republic of China? Yes or no, Jamil? Yes, we read them wrong. Jody? Yes, I agree. I think they're a rival more than they are a competitor. Dana? Too soon to tell. All right. So three votes for us misreading China and one vote for two. too soon to tell. Okay. 30 years. What is 30 years when the Chinese see their history over the course of millennia? Jamil? Well, I actually think Dana's point is exactly right, which is that uh, we in the U.S. are so innovative and productive because we think in one, two, three, five-year terms – the Chinese technically four year terms. Four, well, fair enough when it comes to the presidency. Um, but in terms of our, our innovation, we move fast. The Chinese think long term. You know, the, the Russians think long term. The Chinese think really long term. And so I think that's one of our strategic challenges with them is that they're they're playing a long game and we're playing a very fast short game. Right. Jesus said exactly that, right? He has said that he is on a path to basically the 100-year renewal in 2049 of the People's Republic of China, and he's looking forward to the great revival uh, of the Chinese people. And I think you see that expressed at home. You see it expressed in their near abroad and certainly internationally through Belt and Road. All right, let's uh, let's flex to the current situation, which is almost every hour we're getting updates on the trade negotiations between President Xi and President Trump. Uh, back in March, we thought there was going to be a summit at Mar-a-Lago by the end of the month. Now we're uh, w- almost to Memorial Day here in May, and the, there's nothing imminent in terms of a deal. The Trump administration has decided to specifically sanction Huawei, the giant Chinese telecom company. Uh, the Chinese are very upset by this. Uh, it seems to have pushed off any kind of big trade deal. So let me kind of ask a general question to all three of you. If these trade negotiations proceed down the road and there comes a, there's an accommodation between the two sides and there's some sort of agreement between Beijing and Washington, what's the reaction going to be on Capitol Hill to that deal? How do you anticipate both Republicans and Democrats reacting to that deal? Jody, you want to go first? I think it depends on how long we're at this. So, you know, right now, this trade war is still relatively new and we're beginning to see pretty significant economic impacts. Long before I was a, a Capitol Hill staffer, I was I was a trade lawyer, right? And so understanding the impacts of, of a trade war, both uh, on the Chinese, but really on the U.S., both on exporters, as well as on importers who pay, uh, who pay those duties when goods come into the country, we're really just beginning to see what that looks like. If that were to go on for another three or four months, we're probably this administration can probably pull that out. If this goes on for another year, right, we've seen a 50% decrease in soy exports to China, right, a 14, I think a $14 billion market, right, has now been cut in half. If that continues for very long, it's, it's hard to see how that's sustainable. You're asking whether or not what happens if there's an agreement. But do you, but do you think there's that those, that the punishing return tariffs from China trying to target specific demographics here in the U.S., Trump supporters in rural communities and what and blue-collar workers. Do you think that's actually going to be effective? My sense is that Trump is actually doing just fine with those folks. They see him as fighting for their interests and willing to take on opponents that other presidents, frankly, weren't, weren't willing to do. So I, so I think your... that's right right now. I think that's true right now less. I think that U.S. farmers and honestly, even both parties, Republicans and Democrats, are willing to play this out a little bit longer. There isn't anybody uh, in Washington or on Capitol Hill who is arguing for the Chinese here, right? In fact, China may be the last bipartisan issue remaining in the Congress. And so I think people are willing to give the administration a little bit of space, but the U.S. economy and U.S. farmers won't be able to do that, I think, for very much longer. Right, Dana, and, and then it will have an electoral Dana, I want to push you a little bit on, on the Democrats on the Hill. You know, Sherrod Brown, who's a, who's a good liberal Democrat from Ohio, has actually been 
one of Trump's biggest supporters on tariffs. He's made procedural motions in the Senate to block Senate Republicans from going after Trump's tariff authority. That's as one example of a Democrat on the Hill. What's your assessment of where congressional Democrats are on Trump's specific trade strategy with China using tariffs? So I think, like Jody said, there is bipartisan agreement that the way the Chinese government has used their economy to the detriment of, of American workers and the American economy is a problem. There is not bipartisan consensus on the approach to dealing with it, this confrontational approach, the use of tariffs. And, and you know, I listen to stories and anecdotes and read the papers every day, and you can find you can find farmers and Trump supporters that are both willing to support this approach, and you can also find people who say, no, I didn't sign up for this. And I think the gamble here is is that the administration is willing to bet that the strength of the American economy is so compelling that they can use it as this tool to compel a change in Chinese government behavior when it comes to their own trade and economic policies. But the longer this goes on, it becomes a nationalist issue here, and it drives nationalist sentiment in China. And I don't see how this gets resolved in a way where both sides save face in the short term. So, Jamil, my fellow Republican, the last president, a Democrat, promoted free trade deals with Asia, with Europe. The current Republican president is using tariffs to punish not only our adversaries, but also our friends. What's going on with the Republican Party right now? How is How are our fellow Republicans on Capitol Hill, particularly in the Senate, going to react? How are they reacting now? How are they going to react to a, a potential trade deal with China? Well, look. I mean, it's not like the Republicans of the Senate have uh, have been very robust in their in their uh, pushing back on Donald Trump's um, you know sort of more aggressive parts of his agenda uh, when they don't align with traditional Republican policies, whether that's on tariffs or on other things. Uh, they haven't pushed back on his views on certain areas of national security, um, and so it's not like we've seen a big response from Republicans trying to bring the party away from Donald Trump's brand of populism back to that sort of core. Uh, values of the historic Republican Party. So in a lot of ways, uh, the Republican Party of today is Donald Trump's Republican Party. It is a populist party. Um, it is a party that that supports fighting trade wars. And again, this may be the right trade war. And I'm a supporter of this particular uh, aggressive effort as against China because they have been playing uh, an unfair game for a long time. That being said, there's more behind this trade war than just sort of China and its problems. There is a a strand of populism in in Donald Trump's approach to uh, economics and politics. He is a he is a tax and spend Republican. He may be great on judges. He may be great for conservatives on regulations. But on his sort of core economic philosophy, he is much more like a Democrat. Democrat he used to be. Uh, registered Democrat, probably the largest supporter of the Clintons. Period. Full stop. Um, and so it's not like he's. He's left that that far behind. His if you look at his his trade leadership in in the White House, I mean those are people who are dyed in the wool liberals when it comes to and I don't mean economic liberals, I mean political liberals uh, when it comes to their their economics. So Jamil, it sounds like you're embracing democratic skepticism of Donald Trump's approach here on trade. I think I think the moderate Democrats, the blue dot Democrats, absolutely. I've always found myself more aligned with blue dot Democrats when it comes to economics than sort of the populists in the Republican Party or the liberals in the Democratic Party. And so I think that, you know, I, I was a supporter of NAFTA in, in the Clinton administration. And so I think that's the right approach. Uh, I don't think that protectionism um, and nationalism when it comes to trade is in our economic interests. Does it matter to you or do, do people differentiate within the party if you're, if you're putting tariffs on China versus tariffs on the Europeans and on the Canadians I, and on can the I, Mexicans? Oh, can I answer a question? Of course. I, I think the, the Republican Party outside of President Trump remains a free trade party. But on the question of China, where you've had a, a, a great skepticism in the party over the nature of the government in Beijing for a long time, I think there's a lot more willingness to entertain the use of tariffs as a as a punishment for China and as a way to ratchet up the competition with a with a potential adversary or worse later on down the road. So I think I think outside of President Trump for the most part the Republicans remain free trade but on the specific issue of China I think it's very different. So I agree with you less on China. That is to say that the Republicans are upset about what China's done for a long time. Uh, they do feel like they're a strategic competitor or or rival and that we need to do something to push back. And I think that's – you're right. That's why they're aligned with uh, the Trump administration on this front. I'm not so sure you're right that the Republican Party has not shifted in the direction of Donald Trump when it comes to trade. Uh, there's always been that underlying tendency in the party 
Uh, we saw that with the sort of uh, the Republican movement, even in the House prior to the rise of Donald Trump, right? Um, and so I think there is really a thing going on here that's a longer term trend in the Republican Party. I'm not sure that when it comes to free trade, that Democrats aren't more free trade oriented today as a party writ large than Republicans. I have are. to agree with you, Jamil, right? If you want to back up a little bit and look at the Obama administration when it was looking forward to moving TPP, the reason TPP didn't get a vote wasn't because of Democrats. It was because House Republicans didn't want to put it on the floor, whether or not they didn't like the specific provisions of it or if they didn't want to give Barack Obama a win. But the reason we're not in TPP today is because of the Republican Party. And, and, I, think, and I think the movement of the Republican Party, the Freedom Caucus and sort of that, that movement within the, the Republican Party. So, you know, the populism of Donald Trump is not just a Trump thing. It was a it was a, a process that began years ago in the Republican Party and, and that we've seen take place over time. Now, there are strands of that same populism at the core of the Democratic base also. And so uh, what you see is the, the, the Trump electoral coalition, right, is former steel – Democrat unionized steel workers in Pennsylvania – uh, that are voting for in Ohio that are voting for Donald Trump. It's not sort of the classic Republican or Democrat coalition. It's that collaboration uh, that that was that's been brought out by this populism and this felt sense of of unhappiness from globalization. All right, let's let's flex a little bit to the very interesting issue of Huawei, the giant Chinese telecommunications company. The president has specifically pushed for restrictions on Huawei's ability to do business in the United States, which is going to have a huge impact on their success as a company. This issue has been percolating in Washington for at least two or three years. Dana, can you, can you talk about Huawei and its role in evading sanctions in Iran and that kind of thing that originally started this conversation in Washington about what to do about Huawei? Well, I actually was hoping you were going to ask me a different question, Les, which is about which is about Huawei, its construction of five G networks, not just in the United States, that issue, but in Europe and and in the Middle East. And one of the issues that again, I think there's bipartisan agreement about when it comes to concern about. China and Huawei is the opacity of the relationship. Is it a state-owned enterprise? Who controls who? And if Huawei is is entrenched in in information networks in places like Europe, our partners, our alliances, NATO, or or constructing those networks in the United States, what does that mean for what the Chinese can see? What does it mean for their intelligence collection? We know or surmise that they have been behind some very very serious breaches of our own security um, architecture and, and um, networks. So so part of this is is about concern about the very serious threat to our security, our defense networks, our intelligence networks, the way that we secure information, both government and, and private, if Huawei's the, the dominant presence in, in constructing these networks across the globe. I just want to point out that it was, I think it was three years ago, the New York Times wrote a story about Huawei's competitor, ZTE, which is another Chinese company, writing a memo on how to evade U.S. sanctions in Iran, Syria, Cuba, North Korea. And they referred to Huawei as F7 in that memo as some way to kind of disguise the company they were talking about. Everyone figured out it was Huawei. That was the initial genesis of Washington skepticism about Huawei, is my understanding. Jamil, you're much more, you have much greater facility with these cyber issues. Can you talk about the origins of the skepticism on Huawei and where we are now? And then, and then after that, let's talk about how it impacts the trade deal. Well, look, I think we were skeptical of Huawei long before even the Iran sanctions issue cropped up with ZTE and Huawei. They're both sanctions violators. Uh, they both have ignored uh, clear U.S. sanctions and have sought to evade them. And as a result, they should be punished for that alone. Um, Huawei, however, has been on a long-term trend to uh, to benefit off the back of U.S. innovation, right? The Chinese government engaged in a long-term effort for the last decade to steal American intellectual property and repurpose it for economic benefit at home, right? Uh, my current boss, uh, General Keith Alexander, when he was the director of NSA, referred to it as the greatest transfer of wealth in human history. And it's true because what, what China did was as a governmental matter, they went into U.S. companies – uh, the U.S. government, they stole intellectual property, gave it back to their, their companies, allowed them to build products there on the cheap uh, without the investment of capital uh, that you need in, in R&D to build new capabilities. And so Huawei was a great example. Uh, there's a reason why a lot of Huawei routers look like Cisco routers. It's because they are Cisco routers, uh, just stolen on the backs of American innovation. 
Now, that being said, uh, Huawei has taken that sort of uh, that benefit. Uh, it's also benefited from huge low interest loans or no interest loans from the Chinese government, um, long term payment plans, a close relationship with the government. Um, and it's built a, a behemoth where they can offer goods and services at prices well below what uh, what other competitors can offer, including uh, Western and American competitors. And so that makes it very hard to compete. It makes it very compelling for people to uh, buy their services and buy their core uh, network systems. Now, Dana is exactly right. That is a massive threat to the U.S. infrastructure and to our uh, our friends and allies around the world because while, while a Huawei router or a Huawei switch today might not have an exploit in it, it's being updated constantly in real time. And so every update can carry with it an exploit or a problem. And so we need to be prepared for that. And we know, uh, because of the way the U.S. government works, that the Chinese government regularly engages in very aggressive collection and theft of information, whether it's a, uh, you know, a sort of very capable theft, the kind that we could have, we would have loved to have pulled off when they sold the OPM data uh, thing. That That's standard government tradecraft, right? We wish we could have done that too. But what we don't do is steal secrets and give them to our companies so they can make money. Exactly. Right. All right. So uh, Huawei is a fascinating case. Jody, I want to I tie it back to the trade issue. Uh, the US asked Canada to arrest the Huawei CFO. Canada did so. China responded by arresting a couple of Canadian citizens who just happened to be in China at the time. It's become an issue in the trade negotiations. Can you talk a little bit about how this very discreet issue, although a fascinating one, is impacting the overall relationship between the U.S. and China? Right. So I actually think that these are going to be very separate issues, and I'll tell you why. For all of the reasons that you articulated, right, about what the Chinese have done and how they've used Huawei to steal U.S. IP, the Chinese know exactly what they've done, and they know exactly what they intend to do with that technology, whether it was in the U.S. or in the U.K. or in Germany. They're walking down the road of the competition for 5G, and they can't be very surprised if the U.S. seeks to shoot them down and prevent them from entering uh, into the U.S. market. We know and they know what it would mean for U.S. security. So I think the Chinese like to use this issue to complicate the trade war. They would like to add this to their list of complaints. But in reality, they know what they've done. And I think it's not it's not a legitimate issue for them to add. And I think they know it. And I don't think they're going to be incredibly surprised. They can't be incredibly surprised when we push back. So I'm actually not sure you're right, Judy. I wish you were right. I wish that we wouldn't make the Huawei ZTE thing part of the trade dynamic. But we've seen the president talk about ZTE in the very context of that. We know that they've had this Huawei executive order ready to go for a while, and they've been holding back because they wanted to see how the trade negotiations went. So we know that the administration at least sees some connection between Huawei and ZTE. I agree with you and Dana 100%. This is a real, no kidding, national security threat, and we ought to treat it as such. My worry is that at least some measure of the deal here will be done on the backs of Huawei and ZTE, and that will give them additional room that we shouldn't have. I don't think Huawei is going to be coming into the U.S. and building core network switches anytime soon. Are you are you saying that the administration is going to compromise on the Huawei issue to get a better overall trade deal with China? I think they will be willing to make trades, yes, on the Huawei issue, in part to get an overall yeah. better deal. Like, actually, get to a deal. But I think that's a slightly different issue than whether or not it's it's it's, a, it's tradable, if you will. I don't think it's tradable in its entirety. You saw news right. out today, right, that they may provide exceptions uh, under the executive order for certain, you know, certain Huawei products. And you don't think that's just the beginning of the cave on Huawei to get them back to the negotiating table? I think it can't deal? be. I think it can't be. Except herein is where whatever this trade deal is will be interesting to see how members of Congress react to it. Because if they feel that the administration is trading U.S. national security or making deals about Huawei for the best trade deal ever with China, then that's going to be a problem. And we've seen the president backtrack, for example, on the ZTE issue. I think that was last year. So that is where all of a sudden this becomes very contentious in Congress, whereas in the lead up, as Jody and Jamil have been talking about, there's actually some bipartisan consensus about being aggressive with China on its trade. I think there's a huge amount of pressure on the president to have a tough deal with China. Senator Rubio, Senator Cruz, even Senator Graham, I think, are in a position to kind of outflank him to the right and be highly critical of any deal that shows any kind of weakness. I think, And I think that's one of the reasons we're not getting somewhere. So one thing I think 
everybody needs to keep their eye on is that Chinese considers its overseas telecom providers to be subject to Chinese law. And what that means is that Chinese intelligence services have the right to demand of ZTE and Huawei that they give them access to their networks for intercept. And if we don't keep that forefront in our minds and separate these issues, we're buying ourselves a long-term national security problem. Jody's 100% right on that, Les. I think that we are unanimous around this table on that on that question. Uh, the challenge is, does the Trump administration agree? And I'm not sure they do. I, I think they've been very aggressive and done the right thing here by putting Huawei on the entity list and all its affiliated entities um, and by putting this EO out there. Now the question is, how do they use this EO? The good thing about the EO What's is an EO? the executive order. The good thing about the executive order is that it provides flexibility. You could use it as a cudgel. You could use it as a scalpel. And the new acting administrator of NTIA, Diane Rinaldo, who's been given the authority to do this, right, is actually an NSI, uh, NSI fellow. Part of her uh, part of her challenge, I think, is going to be figure out how to use this tool very capably, right? Um, and I think that she's got the skills to do it. She's been focused on the China issue for the better part of a decade. At the same time, you know, the administration is going to have a position on what to do here, and it may not be the most national security favorable. And I think that Dana's exactly right that that may cause them serious problems in Congress because having now gone down the road of asserting the national security threat when it comes to Huawei and ZT, it's going to be hard to unwind that. All right. Let's uh, let's kind of close out this segment of the episode with a with an exit question. It's a it's a compound exit question. Do you think there's going to be a deal, a trade deal between the U.S. and China? And secondly, if there is one, will it be well received in Washington? So, is there going to be a deal, and will it be well received? Dana, we'll go to you first. I think there'll probably be some sort of deal at some point because the economic pressure. I mean, the Chinese government, at the end of the day, is most fearful of the Chinese people, and they're losing here too. And here in the United States, we're heading into a new electoral cycle, and everyone should be fearful of the American people, particularly in the states and the districts and agriculture that are most hard hit by um, and manufacturing by these current tariffs. So I think there will be a deal. The question is, will it be window dressing or will it be something serious? Les, what was the second part of the question? How will it be perceived in Washington, positively or negatively? Too soon to tell. But one thing we haven't talked about is the debate about TPP was also about labor standards and human rights and these sorts of issues. And this administration has not appear to prioritize those things in its economic negotiations or trade negotiations either. So I see this potentially as another a great political tool for Democrats to shout about if it's not an acceptable trade deal by their standards. Jody? I think, yes, I think we reach a deal eventually. We're a large market for the for Chinese goods, just like they're a large market for, for our goods. So I think we have to reach a deal. I think one thing to keep an eye on is is the U.S. has you know, not decided to reenter TPP, although I think that remains a question out there. It's also not impossible the Chinese could seek to enter the new TPP as, uh, as the arrangement is set up. And in response to your question about how are deals received in Washington, I think everybody is relieved. Jamil? I think Judd is exactly right. There will be a deal. It's a question of how long it takes. And the longer it takes, the more relief you'll see. That doesn't mean that they won't object to the deal. It doesn't mean they won't complain. They will. No deal will be good enough for either uh, sort of super hawkish Republicans or super liberal Democrats. And Donald Trump uh, seems to, you know, get both sides spun up. Um, and so uh, I think you'll see that happen here. There will be a deal. There will be relief. But people will still complain because that's what members of Congress do. Wrong. There will be no deal. No deal between now and the election. All right. So three votes for a deal. Wow. I'm the only vote against the deal. I don't see it happening. I think the president is terrified that as soon as he cuts the deal, he's going to be criticized from the right. And that totally undermines his uh, his base. And he's never and he's never going to risk it. There's going to be no deal. All right. So, so just to be clear, though, Les, you think there's not going to be a deal, not because we can't get to a deal, but because Donald Trump doesn't think it's in his electoral interests. That is exactly correct. Wow. All right. Let's flex to going forward and where, where we go from here with U.S.-China relationship. This trade discussion has pushed off the table a lot of other interesting issues. North Korea, the treatment of the Uyghurs in the west of China, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, other things, the South China Sea. So, Jamil, I want to go to you and talk about Xinjiang province where the majority of the Muslim population of China resides. China's cracked down on that population. They've pushed up to a million people into re-education camps. 
The Chinese military and security forces are there. It's a massive human rights catastrophe. It hasn't gotten a ton of notice in the press or in the West. There's certainly been not much U.S. government response to this. What's your assessment going forward? How are we going to see that issue evolve? How are we going to see new developments perhaps from the Hill, perhaps from the administration, other, some of our allies and friends around the world, what's going to happen in the Middle East? What's the future of this oppression of Muslims in China? Well, look, I think the administration, if it was smart, would go right at this issue. Uh, this is an issue that should come at the core of its, its being, sort of the idea of religious freedom, the idea of religious practice, even if it is sort of you know Muslims, right? And particularly when you talk about the Chinese. Right. And so you would think that this would be an, an issue for the administration to go right at. And yet they've been almost completely silent for over a, almost nearly a year now. Now, Vice President Mike Pence was very forward leaning right at the outset. He sort of pulled back a little bit off of that. Uh, but the administration was smart. They'd turn into this thing and really go at it. I'm surprised they haven't. Um, it would actually benefit them in the Middle East, although oddly enough, the Saudis have not been very forward leaning. And, and that's, of course, you know, a, a troubling concern there, too. But at the end of the day, You've got to look at this and see what the long-term play here is going to be, right, and the situation is going to be, which is to say this is in many ways has the potential to become a modern-day holocaust. Now, it's very dangerous to use that terminology, but that is the situation that we are watching happen, and if we don't take action now, we will all as a world community and particularly as Americans who believe – in the right and the good, we'll regret the day we don't we don't do something about this and don't come right at the Chinese on this and make this part of our foreign policy debate and our economic debate. Right. So I just want to say a couple of things, right? So I think with the issue you mentioned about Saudi Arabia and Mohammed bin Salman, they haven't just said nothing. They've actually said, okay, go ahead. We understand you've got a security issue. What MBS has said on this issue is actually shocking. And, appall- and appalling. Uh, the second thing well, I it goes it goes to the nature of who MBS is. He's moving Saudi Arabia away Correct. from a religiously conservative country to just more of an authoritarian right. country. So that's kind of a natural evolution for him. Right. The second thing I would say I'm on, not supporting it by the yeah. way, but it is no. The second thing I'd say on this in terms of of U.S. policy is you have to recognize whether it's this administration or prior administration, Congress has always led on human rights issues vis-a-vis China, from the Taiwan Relations Act to Tibet to the Uyghurs to the crackdown of dissidents in China and supporting Hong Kong. It is the U.S. Congress that has insisted on the democracy and human rights agenda since Carter adopted the One China Principle. All right. Let's cover some other ground here because we we, uh, don't have a ton of time left. Dana, uh, one of the big issues we're working with China on is North Korea. The Trump administration, of course, has been involved in up and down negotiations with Pyongyang. Now they're a little bit down. China is the patron of North Korea. Uh, The U.S. has never really tried to lay this issue at China's doorstep and ask China to solve it or push China into a position where it had to solve it. What's your assessment of the North Korea phenomenon as it relates to U.S.-China relations? Well, I think one of the where your question is going is, should the United States turn to China and say, hey, you handle this issue? And I think the answer is no, because the Chinese at their core are interested in Chinese security and we are interested in U.S. security. Plus, we have a defense treaty with South Korea, um, the China and North Korea for the Chinese geographically um, is an interesting buffer. And there's a lot of reasons from the Chinese perspective that the status quo will not particularly productive for for everybody in the region is better than the alternative, which is tons of refugees from North Korea rushing across into the Chinese, um, into Chinese territory. And I would also say it's not very clear that the Chinese have played a constructive role as the United States has has sought to move forward with any sort of negotiations. After the the last round of what looks like could be some breakthrough, you had Kim Jong-un on a fancy train going straight to Beijing for meetings. Um, so I'll leave it there. Do you, do you think there's any kind of play Washington can make Beijing has these pretensions to world leadership. They see themselves as a peer competitor to the United States. One of the things the United States does as the world's leading nation is it solves, or at least it attempts to solve geopolitical problems. China has never really had to do that. Is there a way for Washington to play that card with Beijing and say, all right, you're ready for world leadership? 
You have to solve this problem. It's in your backyard. You've enabled it all this time. It's your turn. Step up and help us solve it. I think that's a very American perception of what global leadership is. And the Chinese do not see themselves in terms of what they view as being a global hegemon or a regional hegemon or a leader as solving other other people's or other governments or other countries' problems. That's fundamentally not how they see things. So when the United States talks about, okay, China, you want to be a global leader, you want to be on the global stage, then work collaboratively with us to resolve issues like the serious civil war or the Iran nuclear issue. And we've seen consistently time and time again that the Chinese do not view themselves or their leadership in, in that lens. I think not only that, but China has outwardly rejected the model that was set up by Western nations following World War II. And they really see the U.S. model as being contrary to to their goals, right? They have put forward what they view as an alternative global leadership model that is based around their Belt and Road Initiative and their investment in, in theoretically investment in what they're calling development, even if it is really more like, you know, debt for equity swaps. But uh, that they've they've put forward this alternative global leadership model, if you will. Jody, let's talk about the Belt and Road Initiative briefly. This is essentially one way of thinking about it is China's foreign aid program. They've got a ton of excess capital in their economy that it needs to go somewhere. They're starting to spend it in the Indo-Pacific. For example, I was just in Mozambique last week. China is spending billions of dollars in Mozambique, investing in real estate, investing in the energy sector and the fishing sector. That's happening all around the region in, uh, in East Africa, in Southern Asia, all over the place. What's your assessment of how the administration has responded to this Belt and Road Initiative to BRI? And is it enough? And what, what's the role of democracy promotion in a real response to BRI? All right. So let me say a couple of things. Let's unpack BRI uh, just a little bit. What you're saying in terms of Chinese investments uh, in Asia is uh, is is quite true. But it's not, of course, limited to that region. China is making enormous investments across Africa and in Latin America. We've seen highlights pop up in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times over the last year of particularly egregious cases where China has invested Sri Lanka, the Maldives, Malaysia, uh, where those countries actually feel like they've been they've been taken, if you will. I think it was the Malaysian prime minister who warned of a new version of economic colonialism through China's use of, uh, you know, as I said, debt for equity, where they they basically get a country to buy in, right? They give them loans, knowing that they won't be able to repay them, and then they they come in and say, okay, we know you can't pay it, but we'll we'll make you a trade for equity in your port or equity in your in your oil resources. So. It's nice of them to cast it as a development initiative, but it's really not. And then the second part of BRI is really about China's narrative globally, right? China's not just investing in development. They're investing in universities. They're investing in think tanks. They're investing in media in a massive way globally. CGTN or CC, what used to be CCTV is all over the globe. And really self-censorship is baked into that, into that employment offer. So I think you have to see this as a global hegemonic effort by China and not as a development initiative or even just as a way to move China forward economically. And how is this administration responding to that challenge? So I think that both Congress and the administration are struggling to respond, honestly. Congress went ahead and passed the BUILD Act, which is a first step toward providing resources to countries to, you know, offer development assistance and build big infrastructure projects. It's a start. Uh, I think we're just all getting our bearings on this issue. And frankly, we're all late to the game. Okay. Uh, Jamil, let's turn to kind of some harder edge national security issues. China's building up islands and coral reefs in the South China Sea, claiming that territory for its own. The U.S. is engaged in freedom of navigation, visits by the U.S. Navy to the to the area. It's a, a has potential for conflict, not just between the U.S. and China, but with other neighbors of China in the area. What's the future of of that issue. China's developing missiles that can directly target U.S. aircraft carriers and the, and the way that we project power in the area. Where's that going over the next few years? Well, look, I mean, I, nowhere good. I mean, the last two administrations, including this administration, have done virtually nothing when it comes to uh, China's effort to reestablish the Nine Dash Line I mean, to establish its sovereignty over these, over these islands. Freedom of navigation operations are great if you're going to stand by them and when challenged, you're going to respond. The reality is that nobody thinks 
uh, that this administration is prepared to actually get in any sort of a conflict with China uh, other than a trade conflict. And so the idea that we'll stand by our FON operations if, in fact, they're challenged by the Chinese is, is just not real. Uh, we're pulling out from places around the world, whether it's Syria or, or Afghanistan. Uh, we're withdrawing forces. We're turning inward. And this idea somehow that we're going to be at forward leaning when it comes to China uh, and our military uh, folks overseas, we weren't willing to do that in Venezuela, even though we got out way out in front of that issue. The president did. Um, and so I doubt that's going to happen when it comes to China, uh, because that would be a very, a very, uh, very nasty conflict. And so, look, you've got to be willing to stand up for the right thing here. And we have, in theory, done that. Uh, both in the Obama administration and in and in the in the Trump administration, um, but the reality is that neither administration was prepared to stand by that line when it came to those islands, and that's why China has those islands they do, and why nobody's really challenged the the building of those of those uh, artificial reefs in the South China Sea. All right, let's tie all this together. We've got huge human rights problems with China, uh, with the Uyghurs. Uh, we have a huge economic challenge with China not only the trade war, but also their Belt and Road Initiative. We have big security challenges with China in the South China Sea, with North Korea. So here's the, here's the exit question for this looking ahead segment. Is military confrontation between the U.S. and China inevitable, yes or no? Dana? No. Joe? No, absolutely not. Jamil? It's inevitable. We will, we will absolutely have a military conflict with China at some point in the next 20 years. I agree. It's also inevitable. All right. So we're tied two to two on uh, the inevitability there. Okay. For our final segment, let's go around, around the room quickly. What other issues are you tracking this week that you think are of interest? Dana. Oh, I get to go first every time. So there was a really interesting letter that came out of the House of Representatives this week, bipartisan, led by Tom Malinowski on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And what it highlighted is concern about the sale of surveillance tools internationally. So there's been several stories about people leaving the National Security Agency and other intelligence agencies and basically being hired by foreign governments to interpret intelligence or even set up surveillance and intelligence collection networks in foreign countries, number one. And number two, there's obviously been with the questions of security on communication apps like WhatsApp and et cetera, whether or not certain governments have allowed private sector organizations that developed their tools from the government to sell software or other kinds of invasive technologies to allow governments to then spy on their citizens. For example, the, the Jamal Khashoggi example. So so anyway, this letter is highlighting that. I think this is an area where both members of Congress and the executive branch are late to really looking at the kinds of skills that we, that people acquire inside governments and then they exit governments and then they create off the shelf um, spyware that can be used and people die. Jody. So I'm following the outcome of the world's largest democratic election in India. This is an election that involves 879 million voters and 8,000 candidates for office. So we'll have results back in about two days. There are exit polls that have come out in the last day that predict that the current prime minister, Modi, uh, who is running on behalf of the National Democratic Alliance, will win re-election to a new five-year term. But the Congress party is objecting to the to the outcome of those exit polls and suggesting that they aren't to be believed. But the outcome of that election is critical for the U.S. economically and politically. Jamil. Well, Les, um, if Jody's going to talk about the country that I'm from, that my family's from, I'm going to talk about one of Jody's favorite topics, Iran. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously tensions very high in the Middle East right now with, uh, with the U.S. having deployed a carrier battle group to the region, uh, sent B-52 bombers to the region uh, in response to what our intelligence community picked up as apparent threats uh, by Iran to conduct activities. I think we have not seen the end of this conversation I predict that uh, as the Iranian economy continues to feel the pressure of the very aggressive sanctions regime that Jody helped put in place uh, back in the day uh, that the Trump administration has re has reinstituted, less you did, you were not nearly as big a player as Jody was in that effort. Come although, on. Oh, okay, fair. Your boss, your old boss, Mark Kirk. Fair enough. Um, how much a role you played in that will leave to the side, um, but. Uh, in any event, uh, I do think we haven't seen the end of this Iran debate um, and the Iran situation with the U.S. I predict that we will see cyber attacks from Iran, at least in the region, if not against the United States, and potentially uh, small-scale terrorist activities by Iranian proxies. And so for further uh, information on that, take a look at the op-ed that John Alexander and I wrote um, in The Hill uh, last week on Tuesday. 
That's so, Jamil, just to add on to that, one of the most interesting developments over the last week has been this idea that maybe the Trump administration would engage in new negotiations with the government of Iran. Which, in theory, was the whole plan. That was the whole plan, right? Put maximum pressure on, get a better deal. We'll see what happens. Call me maybe. All right. The issue I'm following uh, this week is a, is a little bit below the radar. Hasn't really made it into the mainstream press, but there's a civil war raging in Libya right now. Forces under General Haftar from the east have moved west. They're getting near Tripoli. The potential for disaster is great. The government of national accord, which the U.S. has supported, which is based in Tripoli, uh, has kind of been holding its own. But the conflict is is boiling and there's, there's a lot of tension in Libya. This was a big election issue four years ago. There's another election coming next year. Who knows what could happen there? All right. Let's wrap it up. Thanks, everyone, who stayed with us through this whole thing. We appreciate your listening. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. If you haven't yet, please take a second to share the Lawfare Podcast on social media and give us a five-star rating and review wherever you found us. You can also now purchase Lawfare swag at our online store, www.thelawfarestore.com. The podcast is edited and produced by Jen Patia Howell, and our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thanks for listening.